just going to talk this evening about the Charleston single house, um, the building type um, as a vernacular structure, and then talk a little bit about Radcliffe's right of the neighborhood. Um, we'll probably in the future do the Charleston single house tour, maybe over and over, but just change the neighborhood around um, in the future. So it's, it's always good information. You always get questions about what is a single house um, on our tours. And docents tend to say different things. Um, so we kind of want to clear that up so everybody's on the, the same level. Um, the single house um, in Charleston harkens back to uh, the way that the city was laid out. The walled city of Charleston um, was the only English uh, fortified city in North America. And the, meet, the uh, boundaries were Meeting Street to the north. Um, up here, that's where the uh, courthouse is today, Broad Street, Meeting Street, Cumberland. The Day's End is about right here. Um, and then the Market Creek was over here. Uh, the Cooper River, East Bay Street, and Water Street, which was Vandross Creek. Um, the buildings of the Walled City, if you've done the overview online on the, the PowerPoints you're taking our uh, Charleston neighborhoods course, these slides probably look familiar. But the wall was put up when Charleston moved to the peninsula. In 1680, they moved from Oyster Point to the peninsula. And this is the what is referred to as the Grand Model this is a copy of 1725 grand model plan that was actually created about uh, 1673. They were already planning to move to the peninsula of Charleston. And it's an English Baroque town plan with a center square. The square is no longer there. Um, St. Michael's is on this corner. Washington Square and City Hall are there. Courthouse here and post office there. Um, but you can see the lots were laid out, creeks and um, marshes throughout the end of the peninsula there. They went ahead and laid out, sold off the marsh, and eventually infilled the creeks. I'm sure all, most of you are uh, familiar with the way that Charleston developed the peninsula. Um, these lots were laid out large, large enough to build several houses on, mm -hmm. however, on the river here, it was developed first, and the lots began to be split up. Everybody kind of wanted a waterfront, not necessarily a view, but it was more for commerce and um, having the port there with the wharves and being close to uh, the water there. Um, this 1739 map, just before the 1740 fire, you can see how densely these buildings are packed in, in the um, streets hugging the Cooper River here. The wall was taken, beginning to be broken down. The outer edges of the wall were made of earth, and, um, and the Cooper River side of the wall was brick. Uh, 1739 map goes along with a 1739 um, view of Charleston, which is You've probably seen it, it's a really long, narrow kind of view of the waterfront. This view gives you a good uh, indication of what the buildings looked like before the 1740 fire. A lot of them were commercial spaces on the first floor with living quarters above. Uh, these were wooden uh, balconies, basically. The earliest term for a piazza I'll get into was uh, came about about 1700. And these wooden balconies actually uh, contributed to the 1740 fire because, of course, they were made of wood. Um, the <coughs> hot climate of Charleston, um, eventually the piazzas would shift to the side of the house, and uh, that would make a difference with fire, really, because the fires would tend to jump from building to building. These wooden porches aided that fire of 1740. Um, Townhouses are in the south. Uh, the, the Charleston single house comes from a townhouse, basically, the English townhouse. In, within the Walled City, um, if, you take, if, you're, if you're doing our Walled City um, tour, 
you've probably heard this already, but the density of the houses, as you can see in this map, very close together. Within the walled city, over on Church Street, the Pyrenees Tenements, and the Pink House over on Chalmers Street, just the, the scale of the buildings are smaller, they're closer together, the ceilings are lower, uh, the building material is of course different. These actually made of um, Bermuda stone. Um, an English townhouse on the left is very similar to the sailor house on Elliott Street. The layout is different. You would have a commercial space in the front room here, and there's actually a side entrance as well here for private uh, rooms above. Um, as Charleston grew outside of its walls, the, uh, the houses became detached, and eventually you wind up with what is called a Charleston single house. Um, this is an example of how people access the, the living quarters above before the Charleston single house became detached. There would be a center um, archway here, would go all the way to the rear of the property. There would be stairs in the rear of the property um, to access the living quarters above. Uh, the front, front rooms of the first floor would be commercial spaces with a center door and two larger um, commercial windows to display your goods or um, services. Uh, you can see some of these still around town. This one next to the Hayward Washington House on Church Street. And of course, um, just down the street, there's Catfish or Cabbage Row, whatever uh, you tend to call it. It's so familiar to everyone from 40 and best. Um, but this remarkably still has its original layout, the center arched um, passageway to the rear of the property and the commercial spaces um, below. Um, later, when buildings became detached, the earliest Charleston single houses, I'm getting a lot of this information, which is in your packet from Gene Waddell's book, the two volume book, um, Charleston Architecture, 1670 to 1860. It's a great um, resource for architecture. Um, and the whole chapter on Charleston single houses is in your packet. Um, and I'm taking a lot of pictures from him. But the way Gene explains it, um, the first, there are three basic types of Charleston single houses. And this is the first uh, subtype. It's detached. Um, it has a piazza, I'll get into that later, but the first type still has a commercial front with a door there. Um, these probably are familiar to a lot of people on Church Street. Um, these originally had doors in the center, and when you walk by there, you can look at the, the lintels above, above the windows there, and the center one is a bit wider than the two windows, so that's an indication that there was a door there. Um, so this is the first type of single house. The single house defined is a single pile. A pile is a row of rooms, uh, a single pile dwelling with a center hall passage, and one room on either side per floor. Um, typical single house plan here, the piazza, this end faces the street, um, center stair hall, one room on each side, and the piazza wraps the building there. The first single houses did not have piazzas. It's a later um, invention and application to most of these buildings. Um, the Charleston single lot, the lot uh, style and um, breaking up the lots when Charleston was first um, settled, they were very long and narrow and that influenced the reason why these houses are very long and narrow to fit the lots. It's a myth that they were long and narrow because of tax purposes. I believe that happened in New Orleans. There's no record of that happening in Charleston. Um, but the reason why these are long and narrow is because of the lot size and the arrangement of the dependencies follow that lot line. Um, the Charleston single house, one side of the building is right up against the lot line, allowing this break between each house. So 
you go from a Charleston Seymour house being attached to each other, then they're detached and the buildings follow in line behind it to give um, air circulation to the property. These buildings, 281 through 285 Meeting Street, uh, were demolished. That is right next door to um, the Methodist Church on Meeting Street at Meeting and Society Streets. There's now like a trunk show uh, building right there with a little shop on it. Sadly, it is a boss. Um, these houses on Church Street, another example of the earliest style of Charleston single house. Um, they did not originally have piazzas. The first Charleston single houses had hip roofs like you see here. The first one being built roughly, I think it says 1765, the middle one 1807, and this furthest one was 1719. So even this one being built well after this one, the model is still the same. And later, the piazzas were added. The earliest mention of the word, the, the words single house come from two carpenters making a deal with Mrs. Elliott who built this house here on Trad Street, no, I'm sorry, Legree Street, 16 Legree Street. Uh, in the letter they say, dwelling house commonly called a single house, three stories high with two rooms on a floor and an entry leading to a staircase in or near the center, with two stacks of chimneys, so it has, so as to allow one fireplace in each room, also with a piazza round the south side and east end. It does not mention that the narrowest end is on the street, which is later um, mentioned in a document Gmodo um, mentions it in, in the papers in his book. Um, so the piazza comes about from the English term when Inigo Jones did Covet Gardens in London, uh, there's an arcaded, an arched breezeway around the garden. That application, the, the English referred to the Italian piazza um, as the square, the, the Italians did, and then the English interpretation, they assumed that this was a piazza. So that's where the term piazza comes from. It's then applied to the Charleston single house um, and to every other house in Iron. <laughs> um, this, the second type of uh, single house is this example here. This is on Cannon Street, 51 Cannon Street. Um, it features the same plan, two rooms on each floor, center hallway. The difference are the chimneys. It doesn't have two side chimneys. It has a chimney in the front to heat these two rooms and a chimney in the back with a back kitchen. So this single house is later, 19th century, um, with a kitchen added on. So it tells you the people who built this house, they cooked their own food. They didn't have a dependency probably maybe had one servant to help around the house. Um, and you'll find, if you look if you look around town, you'll notice these houses more and more. And Jean did a complete inventory of each house type um, of the three main types. There are actually eight or nine <coughs> subtypes of Charleston single houses, which I will not get into today. <laughs> but you can read more about those in his book or in the um, information provided for you. The last type of single house is referred to um, as one of our projects at the Preservation Society that we've been working on are the Freedmen's Cottages, uh, which I thought I had a slide of. Uh, the Freedmen's Cottage, we are terming a Charleston Cottage, this is the third type. It can be one or two stories. The difference is most Freedmen, most cottages have center chimneys. So you have the side chimney single house, the single house with one side chimney, one back chimney, and then you have the single house with a center chimney. Um, those are the three basic types of single houses. Single houses like you see here on Sires Street up in um, 
Elliott Cannonboro were probably built for um, tenement purposes. People would build them right next to each other, rent them out. Um, the size of a single house does not really matter. A single house is a single house, no matter how many stories or how grandiose it may be decorated. A subtype also is the L-shaped single house. This is on Charlotte Street. This can also be applied to the Charleston Cottages. You have L-shaped cottages. You have side chimney cottages, center chimney cottages. Um, some were built with living quarters up upstairs only. Two single family um, families could live in these houses. This one was originally built on Carolina Street with one living quarters downstairs and one upstairs. This Charleston side hall house is another example. It's still one room wide with except the stair hall has been shifted to the property line side of the house. Access upstairs and down is on the side of the house rather than the center of the house, allowing you to open up the doors in the two parlors and create a large room, more air circulation. This was done as early as the 1700s. It's more of an anagram um, just before the Civil War design. Famous Roper House is an example of a side hall house. Um, and on Rutledge Avenue, or I believe that's Wentworth in Rutledge that's actually on tour this year. Um, I'm not going to go into the double house tonight, but we do have Charleston double houses. Most of these houses were built on property lines that were on high land in the neighborhoods. If you go above Buffane Street into Harleston Village, into Mizzy Gradboro, um, you'll find larger homes, for example, the Blackhawk House on Bull Street. It's a larger home. It's four rooms per floor with a center hall. Uh, they were often built not quite on the street. And then the land around them was developed and sold off. And then you find smaller lots, smaller single houses, and sometimes smaller double houses around them. Um, of course, the Miles Bruton House is a fine example of that. Uh, here you see the center hall and four rooms per floor, often a ballroom on the second front room of the house. Back end of the house, and they would also use, have a separate flue to heat the rooms in, in the other two rooms of the house. Were the size of the lot? same size as the side of the houses. You see that the lots were long and narrow. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering how wide they were in relationship to the houses. The Typically about, the house will take up about half of the width of the lot. You can see here on this, this would be the property line, and then this is the house. So the drive would be here, maybe have a stable in the back, or in a kitchen in the back there. Okay. Now I believe I'll get into Radcliffe Borough. Um, Radcliffe Borough is, is now, now consists of the Raglands, which fronted, it used to be called Manigo Street, now Calhoun Street. At this end, it was called Manigo Street. This end, it was called Boundary Street. Eventually, got renamed Calhoun Street. So the Raglands, Calhoun, Keene, Radcliffe, and Smith Streets are the boundaries of Radcliffe Road. It was developed in 1786. Um, Thomas Radcliffe was um, a property owner of, of that development. He was lost at sea. His wife began developing the property um, right after his, his death. 1806, he was lost at sea. St. Paul's Episcopal Church, Radcliffe Borough, was built 1811. So pretty quick to sell off lots. Um, the land for that was actually donated to the Episcopal Diocese. Um, 
Radcliffe Borough, you can see on the Halsey map, uh, Radcliffe Borough is right here. And this is all water and marsh. So when it was first developed, there was a creek coming creek right here that ran up the west side of Radcliffe Borough. <coughs> um, that was quickly filled in and lots were developed. Um, mill ponds were at the western end of what was Manigo Street. This is where Cannon Park is today. There was a, a mill pond for the um, West Point, what is called West Point Rice Mill today. This was the mill pond for that. It was actually a lumber mill. So the lumber would be floated in this, this mill pond. Um, this is looking west towards the mill, which is right there. Um, these houses are, these three houses are still there. One is Daniel Cannon's house, Canborough. Um, they're, I think, occupied by MUSC today. What was the date on that, approximately? This was 1820, probably. Oh, so that would be Cal Calhoun Street? This is Calhoun, okay. yes. And these are just, uh, you know, dikes or levees trying to maintain a water level a water <coughs> level here. Mm -hmm. uh, Bennett Street, that part of Ashley Avenue looks like that every once in a while. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, we know it looked very like this. <laughs> this is looking east from standing on one of those uh, levees. Looking east, you can see uh, the lights were a little dimmer. This is the Cathedral of St. Luke and St. Paul today. The same house is here. So you can see the other. Um, so, Daniel Cannon and Thomas Radcliffe were contemporaries. Um, Daniel Cannon's house here, I think this is Daniel Cannon's house, looks familiar probably, as you race down Calhoun Street. Mm -hmm. um, this is a plat of Radcliffe Borough before it was filled in, you can see Coming Creek here, the actual water line, and then this is just marsh. So this was all filled in. This is Smith Street and Pitt. And then you have, what's that, St. Philip coming, and this was given to the church, and then you have King. It's across, it's at Northern Cross Street. This? Yeah. At Radcliffe? That is Vandross. Okay. So this is the southern part of Radcliffe where what were the Radic lands. Okay, so this would be Calhoun Street then. This is to the middle. Calhoun, yeah. yes. Um, as people started building larger homes above Calhoun Street, larger churches were built above Calhoun above Calhoun Street to accommodate them. Um, this is, of course, a, in the Zeke Ragboro, uh, Second Presbyterian Church. It's 1809, other side of Median King Street. In Radcliffe Borough, a similar, larger church was built um, for the Episcopal Diocese. It was St. Paul's Radcliffe Borough, and then St. Luke was where New Tabernacle Fourth Baptist Church is in the, in the Zeke Ragboro. They then merged and became the Cathedral Church of St. Luke and St. Paul here on um, Cumming Street, St. Philip Street. Cumming. <laughs> um, larger, there are some antebellum villas in Radcliffe Borough. You can probably count on one hand. This one is 1820, and it's attributed to Robert Mills. It sits off the street on Vandross, corner of Vandross and Thomas Street. Um, it has octagonal rooms, which, if you see, a, I don't have a floor plan of it. The two rooms on either side of the stair hall are octagonal, and of course, three stories, three bays wide. Mm -hmm. One across the street on Thomas, at the other corner of Thomas and Van Ross is, a, is another larger Annabelle and Villa. Um, Radcliffe Borough. When it was developed, these larger homes, uh, again, subdivided the property around them. So smaller homes you'll see around them. Um, 
closer together and set mostly on the street. Another loss in Radcliffe Borough is, of course, the Charleston Orphan House that sits, or used to sit where Barry Dorn is now. Of course, it was raised for a Sears and Roebuck um, parking lot. Um, the history of the Orphan House actually goes back to the 1700s. I think it's 1792 when the first Orphan House was built on the site, and then it was remodeled, um, I think, in the 1850s. This is another plat of the area in which our tour will be most mostly focused. Um, Warren Street, we have a lot of smaller single houses along Warren Street here. This is King, um, St. Philip, and coming here. There are some dorms here, and our we have a house that's right here. I think two or three on Warren Street, right? Mm -hmm. This general yeah. block. And we have 135 coming on tour, which is right here, an early Charleston single house, I think 1830s is the mm -hmm. date on that. So we don't have on our tour side halls. Um, we don't have a good example of each style of single house, but we still want to educate the tour goer about the three styles, I think. Um, it's important to let them know um, exactly what the single house is, its origin, and um, tell them that they're you know, a different variety of single houses. It's not really the style, it can be Greek, it can be Romanesque, it can be Italianate, it's just the building form that's so unique to Charleston is what we want to explain to um, the tour goer. This is, of course, the bird's eye view of, of Charleston specific to Radcliffe Borough. So this is kind of looking west. Uh, you have the cathedral here, our um, smaller single houses on Warren Street are all of these, right along here. 135 coming, right there. We have one on the pit down about right there. So the majority is going to be on Warren Street. These smaller, modest single houses. Uh, one, the 135 coming, and I think it's 71 pit, are a little yeah. bit larger in scale, a little bit higher style, but not as high style as what you would see in Harleston Village or south of Dupain Street. Just some quick facts. Um, in Radcliffe Borough, this 64 Vandross is right across the street from the, the octagonal room house um, on Thomas Street. The first, or the earliest, uh, African American, free African American Episcopal Church was built in Radcliffe Borough. It was architect design on Thomas Street, 14 Thomas. Um, just some quick facts. I sectioned off by Thomas Radcliffe, finished with his wife, and some one plantation style home, a kind of a Barbadian style home, still exists in Radcliffe Borough. We will probably point it out on a map that we hand everyone for the tour. It's not, I think it's a bunch of college kids that live there now. <laughs> but, um, it is on a raised basement. It is, uh, I can't, it's at the corner of Thomas Street and Radcliffe. It's the northwest corner of Thomas and Radcliffe. And it's the uh, Shepherd Wilson House. And was named that for Sophia Francis Shepherd Wilson, who was the great niece of Thomas Radcliffe. Um, she grew up in that, inherited that house, and she had a farm in the northern, in the neck of the peninsula, which we've done a lot of research on, and is now termed Wilson's Farm neighborhood, above the Crosstown. Um, and the last thing I'll leave you with, Elizabeth O'Neill Verner, a Charleston Renaissance artist, uh, in the 1920s, ventured up that far. In the 20s, it was kind of a rough neighborhood. No college kids. Um, <laughs> but she, sat in this spot. Is anyone familiar with the Jewish cemetery on yeah. um, Cumming Street? Cumming Street yeah. She's basically sitting right in front of that, looking back at the cathedral here and etching this 
backwards because that's the way you had to edge. Um, so Radcliffe Borough does have a tie to Charleston Renaissance, but um, does anybody have any questions on Radcliffe Borough or any of the homes on tour?